Hi, welcome to our SDEX webinar today, um, unveiling the next chapter of crypto. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this uh, session today, and I'm very pleased to be joined by, um, by our three very esteemed speakers, which is Adrian Chung, founder and uh, group CEO of Fintonia Group, Annie Ong, group general manager for ChainUp, and also Wimal Gore, who's the CIO for Trovio. So the, um, we wanted to bring you this webinar on crypto because we understand that this is a topic that's caused quite a lot of um, confusion for the general investing public. And we wanted to take this time to demystify some of the kind of trends and topics and understanding of the crypto market. Um, so I just wanted to clarify what SDEX is. So SDEX is not a crypto exchange. However, we put on our pro on our platform products which are structured in the forms of securities or fund units. And um, sometimes these products have uh, have an exposure to crypto. And we thought this would be a good way to kind of introduce the, some of the partners that we work with, uh, for example, Fintonia and Trovio and Chainup, and for them to also explain to um, to all of us how how they're seeing crypto, what crypto is, why should we why should we still include it? So um I'll just let the I just want to introduce our speakers one by one and let them kind of introduce themselves. So we'll start with Adrian Chung, who's the founder and group CEO of Antonio. Thanks, Rachel, and uh and thanks to the ISTEX team for inviting me here. Uh just a brief background of, about myself, uh, about a decade in traditional finance. Um the second decade of my career was in uh in technology. Um, particularly in fintech, but also in consumer tech, and hopefully the uh, the third decade of my career will be in uh, the Web three space. And it's great to be here. Thanks, Adrian. Um, yeah. So next up, we have Annie Ong, who's a GM at ChainUp. Hi, um, I'm Annie, the general manager of ChainUp Private Limited. Uh, ChainUp is actually a global end-to-end -end blockchain technology solutions provider founded in, uh, founded in 2017. And the headquarters is in Singapore. This is where I'm based out of as well. So we have actually served more than 1,000 clients across 30 countries, reaching over 60 million end users. Uh, myself, I'm responsible for managing ChainUp Group's uh, global sales team, focusing on financial service and other key industries. Uh, before ChainUp, I have actually hold multiple regional sales management or business strategy leadership roles with a proven track record in leading diverse global sales team uh, to achieve success in both multinational technology companies like IBM, Oracle, Salesforce, and also startup company or pre-IPO companies like OneConnect and as well as ChainUp now. Um, so I'm excited to be part of this distinguished uh, panel alongside with my fellow experts today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, and third, we have Wimal Gore, who's CIO of Trovio. Hi, um, thanks for having me along today. So I'm Wimal Gore, I'm CIO of Trovio Group. Uh, Trovio is a Singaporean company. We're a hybrid technology asset management company. So half of our business is about providing technology solutions, uh, generally about digital registry, blockchain, on-ramps, off-ramps, imagery management, those kind of things. Uh, we do quite a lot of decarbonisation as well. And then we have the asset management function, which manages both traditional finance and uh, emerging assets, which we class as digital assets. I've got 30 years experience in the markets managing macro portfolios. And we're doing, um, I've been at Travio for a year now, but been involved in the digital asset space for about the last four years. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll just go move straight into our questions. And I think first and foremost in everyone's mind is, why is crypto still relevant? Like, should should we still be investing in crypto? Is crypto still something that we should be um, looking seriously and in including in our investment portfolios? Um, so Adrian, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rachel. So I guess the blockchain or the Web3 uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> industry, uh, where we are is very similar to the uh, the early days of the internet or in the dot-com days. And in the early days of uh, of the internet, it was uh, very skeptical. There are a lot of bad actors. And, you know, there are a lot of questions about why do we need to use the internet? You know, it's only, you know, used for... Uh, uh, for nefarious activities. And it, it, it reminds me, um, you know, when I ran uh, JobsDB, uh, it was unheard of uh, in those times for people to go online and look for a job. And, <clears throat> and that's kind of where we are at the early days of uh, the next phase of the internet is 
Um, we have this new technology and the, the powerful combination for JobsDB um, when we ran uh, up against the newspapers is that when the technology combines with changes in consumer behavior, then we have really big changes. So in the dot-com crash, which is around 2000, um, and now you fast forward, we have Google, we have Amazon, we have uh, Expedia, we have a whole bunch of companies that came through that time. And that's kind of where we are now. And maybe we can go into the next slide where we can also see the kind of adoption um, of internet users. And we can also see that we are the early stage, if you plot uh, digital asset or crypto users um, of that adoption curve. And it's very, very similar to the late 90s um, uh, time in terms of adoption. And as you know, in technology, as adoption increases, it hits a uh, an inflection point. Yeah. So if we can go to the next uh, slide, so when I ran DropsDB, we were talking about that middle column, that platform economy, which is essentially network effects. So running a jobs business, um, you have network effects when you have more job seekers looking for jobs, which means you can attract more advertisers, which means you can get more unique jobs on your platform, which means you can then have more job seekers, get more jobs, uh, ad adverts, more companies. And you have this kind of virtuous circle, this network effect. And those are just things which did not really um, come out of traditional businesses, right? This technology change, um, the ability to search and match people uh, for jobs, whether that's income, et cetera, income, distance to the, to the job, uh, together with the fact that more and more people online created this platform economy or this, uh, this, this network effect. And we see this now with Facebook, um, uh, Amazon, uh, et cetera. Now, if you look at the last column, which is the early days of where, where we are today in Web3, we have something called the protocol economy. And I want to take the example of Ethereum. So in JobsDB, if I wanted to grow, I had to hire more tech people, I had to hire more product people, and, and I was a central entity and I, I, I run out of resources. And so I'm always trying to hire more, more tech talent, uh, more product managers, etc. But in Web3, or well, if we take Ethereum as an example, all of a sudden you create this token called Ethereum or Ether, which you can only use on their network to build things. So it has a use, but it also has a value because you need to use it to, uh, uh, to develop things on the network. And what happens is people who have this token, the developers, they have an economic incentive to develop more. So Ethereum has given tokens out to, I guess, the community. And you have this thing now called community effect. So you've gone from network effect to community effect. So all the developers now have an incentive to build on the Ethereum network and create value. And so Ethereum has come from nothing in 2015 or 16 to become one of the dominant uh, protocols where more and more people are building applications on, on the Ethereum network. And now it's whatever it is worth, 250, 260, a billion US dollars. So that's an example of what we call the protocol economy or the, the community effect where the token is used on the network and gives people an incentive to build more value in that network. And that's something we're in the early days. So it's a combination of technology plus, um, I guess, consumer behavior, which is, which is kind of the bedrock of, uh, of what Web3 might become. However, maybe go to the next slide. Um, just like in the internet.com boom, wherever there is money, there's bad actors. So every time there's a lot of money, whether it's the internet boom, whether it's resources boom, you always will find people who are, who are perhaps um, uh, in the early days, uh, not the best actors. So I think 2022 demonstrated that actually being licensed um, is or working with licensed partners is actually pretty important because what you find um, you have the technology aspect then you have the money aspect of web3 and in the money aspect you really should be looking for people who are licensed in a in a major jurisdiction because when when that's when they're licensed then um, things that you take for granted um, 
today, in 2022, we saw that it didn't apply. So we saw people take customer assets, uh, run away, uh, don't have uh, 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 proper technology or reporting or uh, internal controls, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in the early days of a boom, uh, and 2022 showed us that licensed institutions in a jurisdiction like perhaps Singapore or, uh, or other um, major financial centers, uh, probably the right partners you should be working with. So essentially, um, if you go to the next slide, this kind of answers why is this still relevant? Uh, because 2020 wasn't long ago. If you all recall, we were in COVID, it's not that long ago. And yet the asset class has uh, has essentially gone up six times. It's still $1.2 trillion. Um, uh, dollars. So it's too big to ignore. Um, people don't realize it's that big. If you take Bitcoin, which is like a digital form of gold, it's now 500 odd million, a billion, sorry, in market cap. It's bigger than Singtel. Um, the liquidity of Bitcoin, as an example, uh, is around 10 to 20 billion dollars, uh, US dollars a day, which is uh, more than a lot of the, uh, the stocks trading on the Singapore Stock Exchange. So actually, um, despite being at the early stage of adoption, uh, as you can see, it is now, uh, I would say, too big to ignore and definitely something that uh, potential investors need to understand better because whatever you invest in, you should understand. So um, that's kind of a high level overview of why you should at least be thinking about and understanding what is this thing called Web3 and what is what is this crypto asset class? Yeah, thanks for that uh, overview, Adrian. I think it's kind of good to kind of set the scene of what and how big this asset class is. So I'm moving on to Wimal next. Uh, sorry, we're still on the first question. Like, Why do we still <laughs> crypto? So Wimal, you're the CIO of Trovio. Why are you including, uh, why do you include um, yeah, digital assets in your portfolio? Um, I think it follows on from Aiden's point. It's uh, that it says it in this last bullet point here. It's an asset class that is now too large to ignore. And so if you have an asset class which is growing, it's emerging, it offers a lot of opportunity and offers a very, um, very attractive risk return profile. And what it means is that the upside is very large relative to the downside. Now, it doesn't mean that there is a risk that the asset goes to zero, but it could also go up 100x. And so when you look at it from that point of view, it's a very capital efficient um, asset class and, and exposure. And so therefore you can introduce it in a small size to your portfolio and it has a material impact on the return. And so you can see that now that when you look at 60, 40 portfolios and introduce digital assets like Bitcoin or Ethereum or other digital assets into it, it massively increases the risk return. And there's been numerous studies on this. I mean, um, MIT did quite a large one, Citibank did one. And they, they're recommending that somewhere between 2 to 5% of diversified portfolios, that's a decent starting point for, for digital assets. And ultimately, when you're looking at asset classes, as long as you get some diversification from your asset class and you get um, a correlation benefits, diversification benefits, you should be introducing your assets into your portfolio. And this is also in a world that we've come in from post-GFC, where there's been um, increasing government intervention in bond markets and um, increasing uh, prevalence of passive managers and passive index flows in equity markets as well. And so the ability to diversify and build um, robust or weather portfolios has become a little bit harder. So having your assets you can rely on and reduce your portfolio certainly gives you a different outcome and a much better mix, we would argue. Okay, so it's back to diversifying and including this asset class that's really too large to mm. ignore. So... Um, I think we'll move on to the next question because it's quite a good seg, right? So what is the market outlook for crypto? And I mean, like the other question is like, how do we differentiate between the different kinds of crypto? Uh, and I'll start with any, like as you know, you, you sit in quite a unique position, which is slightly different from uh, from Fintonia and Trovio and you, you are at more of like a service provider kind of level. Like what do you see from your perspective as the market outlook for crypto? Um. 
maybe address, you know, since there's two part of the question, so I talk a little bit regarding the uh, differentiate between the main and mem coins itself. Um, so I think for the main coins, uh, the example will be Bitcoins and Ethereum. So main coin actually serve as the foundational pillars of the cryptocurrency market. It offers stability and established use cases. Uh, Bitcoin, for example, the pioneer and being recognized as the store of values. And Ethereum, you know, the platform for decentralized application with its uh, versatile smart contract capabilities have captured the attention of both retail and institutional investors across the region. So in countries like Japan, South Korea, and even Singapore, main coins has uh, garnered recognition as the digital asset and valuable technological platforms. So the market outlook for main coin in the Asia Pacific, so I'm looking into more Asia Pacific region itself, is influenced by their global adoptions and their relevance as a store of value asset. Uh, as central bank and government explore digital currencies, main coins remain at the forefront, driving the discussions about the future of money and the role of decentralized technologies. Now, having talked about main coins, the other side of it is meme coins, right? Uh, some example is Dogecoin and uh, Sibu Inu. And meme coins actually have also made their mark in the Asia Pacific region, reflecting the region's tech savvy populations and cultural receptiveness for the global internet trends. The rise of Dogecoin driven by community engagement and viral content highlights you know, the region's propensity to embrace playful digital assets. But however, with this in mind, the market outlook for meme coins in the Asia Pacific region require careful assessment. While they can attract attention and short-term speculations, the lack of foundational use cases and technology that main coins offer. And APEC investors are advised to approach meme coin with caution, understanding, and speculative nature and potential risk. Uh, 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 that will be my view, you know, from there. Um, and in conclusion, you know, in, in general, the market outlook uh, from Asia Pacific perspective, the Asia Pacific uh, cryptocurrency market shows promises due to its tech forward approach and increasing blockchain adoptions. So main coins are expected to maintain their role, as I mentioned just now, as key digital asset, and it will support by institutional interest and growing regulatory clarity in countries like Singapore and Japan. Uh, this nation, known for their fintech leadership, are likely to drive the adoptions of main coins and part of a uh, broader digital transformation effort. And main coin, on the other hand, while reflective of the region's cultural trends, require caution due to their speculative nature. And APEC investors should prioritize a balanced approach focused on investment rooted in solid technology, use case, and sustainable growth. So that will be my view. Okay, great. Thanks for that overview. Um, Actually, just going back to Vimal. So I'm going to ask a cheeky question. Where do you see the kind of price trend of like kind of the coins that you are investing in? I'm assuming that most of the coins that you do invest in are the main ones rather than the meme ones. Uh, yeah, I mean, feel free to kind of talk us through some examples. Yeah, that's correct. So we focus really on the, the top 50 coins. Um, and then we knock out the means and the algorithmic stables and those kind of things to come up with investable units about 30. Um, as Adrian mentioned, the, the key driver valuation in this space is adoption. And so you can look at users, um, you know, for DeFi, you can use things like TVLs. Um, but generally, if you look at adoption, which, which follows a very well-worn path, you've seen this exponential adoption through many asset classes in the past. You look at Amazon, Google, Meta, Stock, they've, they've all had these, these similar price movements. Um, adoption is the best way to get a handle on on the um on the on the the magnitude of the price and then for bitcoin there's numerous other indicators you can use um you can look at um <clears throat> a number of on-chain analytics you can use period to halving obviously the next halving is coming up in about april next year and so we're reaching that kind of you're not far out from the six month window now which generally sees quite stronger price appreciation um i think though if you step back and look at the asset class it's very clear that that as the adoption picks up, the, the asset class is gaining institutional um, you know, awareness. And once we get through to 
a period where the regulation has more clarity and so people know how they're going to be taxed and how they're going to be treated by the authorities. I think once that that area gains more more uh, clarity, I think there'll be a big, I mean, we talk about it all the time, that there'll be a big influx of, of new money into this space. And that might be led by the, the ETFs, the BlackRock and, and the likes of Fidelity are, are lining up as well. So I think we're in the, the very early stages of what could be a, a significant bull market. Um, remember, though, as well, that it is emerging asset class. It has been, you know, it, as, as, as the size grows, um, it, it becomes le obviously less volatile by mathematically. But as, as it's grown through this time, it goes through these periods of large up moves and then down moves. And we've seen, you know, numerous drawdowns of kind of 80% since the inception of the currency and, and of Bitcoin. And so that's, it's, it's, you know, it's a volatile asset. Recently, it hasn't been, but it generally historically is a volatile asset. And so you should definitely be involved, but treat it with caution as well and make sure that you size your allocation correctly. That's the best thing, a bit of advice we could say to anyone. Okay. Uh, and I guess that's generally good advice, right? To understand the kind <laughs> yeah. of type you have and then apply like good, like, um, diversification kind of applications to your portfolio. Yes, and back to Adrian. So what's your view on crypto? Talk about the coins that you are most uh, focused on. Yeah, I guess, you know, we we focus on uh, uh, Bitcoin primarily. And I think it's important to uh, understand the difference between Bitcoin and the other uh, 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 coins or tokens um, uh, in terms of the use case. Um, uh, a lot of the other tokens are, uh, as Vimal, Vimal mentioned, are, uh, are technology uh, platforms in some way. So it's, it's almost like a liquid venture capital uh, portfolio. Uh, so adoption and usage is important. Uh, whereas in Bitcoin, I think is a little bit different. It's a little bit like gold um, and uh, as a store of value. And for Bitcoin, there is a, a programmed uh, halving of the rate of production every four years, and that's estimated to be uh, about April next year, and that often drives uh, the price of uh, of Bitcoin. Similar to in a commodities market, when the um, if the cost curve has a shift up, the market clearing price for uh, that commodity also goes up. So for for us, um, uh, we focus a lot on Bitcoin and uh, the uh, the upcoming halving and. Uh, and a lot of the institutional interest that is uh, that is coming into uh, into Bitcoin. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I think it's kind of good seg into the next question, right? So if you are convinced by this story that yes, we should, um, like look at you know consider this really large asset class that is too large to ignore. And yeah, we've heard from Vimal that he thinks it's going to get bullish. We heard from Adrian that you know like there's going to be a halving of uh the kind of supply of Bitcoin next year. So that's going to have an impact on price as well, obviously uh, upwards, we hope. So then what are the alternative ways to holding crypto apart from like the traditional ways, which, you know, holding it in your own wallets and stuff like that. So, I mean, kind of just to give a little bit of background as, as well, which I mentioned at the start of this webinar, ASDAX is not a crypto exchange. We do not deal with crypto and we do not, um, we don't facilitate that, right? There are other exchanges that do that. We are regulated securities, and, uh, we're a regulated securities platform. So anything that's on our platform is in the form of securities and fund units. And that's why we're speaking to people like Fintonia and Trovio to kind of explore like the different ways that we are able to hold crypto. Uh, and also allow uh, any in this section to kind of talk about the the kind of um the the kind of um the, the trends in this market where we're making sure that, you know, holding crypto is becoming safer and safer at an institutional level, right? So, um, yeah, why don't we start with Adrian? Yeah, so I think if you are a, a technology uh, geek, I guess, like uh, like myself, then uh, Web3 and digital assets, you can, uh, you can, as you say, use a wallet. Uh, you can uh, kind of uh, work out how to do it. But given it's a nascent industry, um, what we've seen is obviously uh, uh, some challenges like hacking. So uh, if you if uh, it's digital form of value, um, we, we've seen over the years a number of different hacking scams where uh, perhaps you click on the wrong link and you give someone access to your wallet and uh, and then you, you kind of get assets uh, cleaned out. So I think if you are technologically inclined, I would always encourage people to try and uh, and 
themselves to uh, to purchase some uh, cryptocurrencies, to stake it, to secure the network, and actually uh, go through that process. But for the majority of people, um, this might not be so easy uh, 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 to do, right? Um, so if we take Bitcoin as a form of digital gold, a pure a, a person who believes in holding gold themselves, um, the purest might say, well, in the event of war, I want to have my gold. So I will buy my own gold. I will build a vault and I will store the vault. Um, I'll work out the security and the passcode so no one can actually enter in the vault. And I will also figure out where I can sell and buy uh, this gold, right? But for the majority of the world today, no one, you know, most people don't go and do that, right? They will find other ways. So one common way that would work is to actually use a professional fund manager, right? Who will then sort out how do I buy and sell because there are 1,000 exchanges. So buying a, a, a cryptocurrency asset is not like buying Apple shares where it just trades really on one exchange with one price. Uh, if you want to buy Bitcoin, for example, you can go to probably over 1,000 exchanges and the price can differ anywhere between 2 to 8 to even 25% in some anomalies, right? So actually, um, sometimes if it's, if, if it's not your full-time job, uh, working with um, partners, uh, fund managers or, or, or other licensed institutions uh, can kind of, uh, we say, bring order to this chaos because it's still early days. It's not like buying shares in uh, on the SGX or uh, or Nasdaq, and so um, I would always uh, say if you're going to partner with someone, then 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 make sure they're licensed, right? At least as a starting point. Yeah, I mean that's a really good point. As a licensed and regulated platform ourselves, we definitely very uh, put a lot of importance on the fact that we only want to work with licensed and regulated partners because I mean the, the regulation is there right to protect us. Um, yeah, moving on to Wimal, I mean like you're a licensed fund manager. <laughs> like talk to us about what's a good way of you know holding this and maybe talk to us about how, um, yeah, the diversification you know, of the fifty coins that works. Yeah. So just on that point, I completely agree. It's like if if you're very technologically savvy and you're able to hold your own coins and move them off, in, off into a you know cold wallet, well then that's the ideal way to do it. But invariably people don't, and there's risks associated with that as well. That you know you lose your your nano ledger. I've got one sitting around my desk here with my my exposures on. Um, so you got your nano. You could, I could lose that. I could lose my seed phase. I can want to move money around and not be able to do it quickly. And so, and also when you're institutional, um, you don't want to have that risk. You know, you don't want to have that operational risk sitting within your own entity. And that's part of the, the reasons for having fiduciary that works on your behalf. Um, and that's what asset managers do. And so we, we think about the custody and the safekeeping of assets as important as which assets we buy. Because ultimately, um, you know, the market has been through um, a number of periods of bad actors. Um, now, there's nothing, there's nothing specific to digital assets that have caused this. It's just a nice and um, growing ecosystem where they've just been perpetuating bad actors the same way you could, you know, Madoff did in U.S. equities. I mean, it's the same, it's the same um, frauds and problems you can have in every space. It's not, it's not specific to digital assets, but because it's a uh, it's in a space which is gaining regulation. It still has has some um, has some issues around counterparty risk and credit risk. So you need to be very careful about um, with one what assets you buy. And we talked about meme coins, and Annie talked about meme coins. But also when you bought an asset, how you hold it. So which custodian you hold it at? Um, are they registered? Where they domiciled? Um, you know these kind of what the the clarity of. Um, um, your assets in, how quickly you can move your assets around. These are all very key questions. And they're, they're questions that are going to be all, all processes and procedures which are ongoing and, and getting tightened up daily. So you've got to spend a lot of time with your risk and compliance team working out the best ways to, to manage your portfolio and hold your your assets operationally. And we spend a lot of time and effort to make sure that we, we, we try to adhere to the best practices we possibly can. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for thanks for that insight. Uh, yeah, and lastly, to any, I mean, like, speak to us about how I mean, what advances you're seeing in making sure that you know crypto is being held safe for, 
I, especially when you work with institutions like uh, Fintonia and Trovio and how how that is developing to be more and more secure. All right. Um, maybe back to a little bit, or I just wanted to add on to the previous question regarding the alternative uh, holding, you know, because I thought, um, I mean, both uh, Adrian and uh, Vimo, actually they mentioned about some ways of doing that, but I thought there was actually two that I wanted to highlight as well, which is actually security token offering and new real world asset tokenization. Uh, they both of them actually align with the concept of alternative holding structure of crypto because they offer a way to indirectly hold and manage traditional assets using blockchain technology. And these structures uh, enable investors to gain exposures to traditional assets and financial instru instruments through blockchain technology, offering unique benefits and opportunities like increased liquidity, you know, being transparent, um, there's fractional ownership and accessibility to a wider range of investors. And they demonstrate the evolving potential of blockchain technology to bridge the gap between traditional finance and the digital domain. And this will create innovative investment avenue for individual and even the institutional alike. Um, and just one example of the projects that we are working on at China, we actually jointly develop a real-world asset tokenization use case and uh, even conduct a proof of concept of SDO platform together with one of our key customers uh, in Singapore. And together, we actually do this POC in MAS Sandbox itself. And this will help to validate the values of uh, Web3 technologies at the same time, you're promoting a secure and compliant way of uh, alternative holding structures. Um, and back to your question just now, how do we ensure, you know, uh, the cryptocurrency or the digital asset is being safely kept? There are actually different areas to, to look at. Uh, for example, when you are onboarding and when the transaction is happening, uh, there will be actually process and uh, technology and tools to ensure that a proper KYC process, for example, during the onboarding, uh, make sure that we onboard the right person, uh, the legit, you know, entity, you know, to this uh, entire ecosystem itself. And during the the transaction is that we will have um, technology and solutions like KYT, know your transaction um, to reduce, to mitigate uh, the, the risk uh, of having uh, some blacklisted source of fund, for example, and uh, whether that is actually AML and in money laundry uh, transaction ha happening, and then we can actually rule out all this and better safeguard uh, of the asset. Then lastly, the other angle or the other aspect of it will be coming from uh, the wallet. Um, many people believe that cold wallet probably is the safest way uh, of managing that. Yes, that could be one, but that is not the only solution. So as technology advanced, they could be even looking at self-custody uh, wallet uh, to ensure that the user themselves will have a part of the private key. They have control. They can manage the private key and therefore they can self-control the use state, the utilizations of digital assets, and therefore it's not within the hand of others, and others can use their asset uh any time that they want, you know, without your knowledge. So with the technology happening, then these are the few aspects and area to ensure that uh, it is securely uh and is actually happening uh, to help protect the users uh and the greater public interest. Okay, thanks for that, Annie. I mean, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg of the, all the kind of various um, security developments that are, you know, progressing in this arena. So we're going to move to some of the questions which are actually quite interesting. And I love this question that has come up, mm -hmm. right? So how should I explain crypto to my mom? So I'm going to ask you, uh, Adrian, to start with that. And then with all, you're going to have a crack at that as well. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll try and give two examples. Or, or So... The internet version one, they say, was read only. So you would just read information one way. They said the version two of the web was uh, read and write. So I can now give back information, whether it's my Instagram post or in, in the cases of uh, my company, I used to run to DB. Uh, we also put back CVs and people's uh, information. And, and web three, we talk about read, write, and own. So all of a sudden, you have ownership of a token that is used on the network. So that's the web three. Right. That's and and so Web three only exists because of this ownership of a token aspect. So that's one way. So the crypto that you own, it's used on a network. Then, from a purely financial perspective, it's like what when you buy the the crypto token um, for purely financial means, it's like buying, let's say, an American Club membership. 
or a fitness first gym membership, right? We're buying a fitness first gym membership. We can only use it at fitness first. And we're basically making a call that the fitness first gym equipment, classes, atmosphere is going to be better than Virgin Active down the road, right? And and, and we're kind of doing that. Um, but the difference also is that the gym instructors and the equipment manufacturers and all these other people also own the Fitness First membership, right? And so they have this incentive to do better classes, come up with new things and, and, and increase the value of the Fitness First. So the Fitness First membership has a use. We can go to the gym, we can do all these cool things. People own that crypto uh, and they can uh, improve the value of that. And then out of all of that, you have some people that also just buy it purely for secondary market trading, right? I think the Fitness First gym is going to be better than that gym. And so that's essentially what Web3 and crypto is. It's a public blockchain. It's read, write, and ownership. And, and you can have a view or influence on the value of the network or the technology protocol that you're on. And then there's this money part, which is people like to speculate or buy American Club or Fitness First memberships. Yeah. Okay, so I guess in your example, the more people the more people use fitness first, yeah. the more that membership is going to increase. So that's what we talked about when we were saying adoption of networks and uh, how right. that increases. And network. then there are some people that can actually influence how good that fitness first membership is. So if you look at Ethereum, there are people building great decentralized applications on the Ethereum network because they own it. They also have to pay using ether uh to use the network as well so it's kind of a we call it the community effect it's kind of its own protocol economy in a way okay yeah that, that's an interesting analogy i haven't heard of jim hmm. one before. uh Wimal, you want to have a go yeah i think that was a really good a really good way of explaining I, i'll just go away further so you can actually step back and and think about it as that you can think of cryptocurrencies or or for better way of describing digital assets as, as the same as you think about stock markets or or mid cap or small cap stocks. So you buy Domino's Pizza because you you one you probably like eating Domino's Pizza, but two you think that they have a good business plan and more people are going to use them, and therefore you want to participate in the price rise of that asset. It's the exact same thing in digital assets. Their 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 protocols you could class argue they're companies even though they're, they're diversified. And distributed, you can say that you the reason you buy Ethereum or Ether is because you believe there's going to be more usage on that network, it's going to become more prevalent, more adoption, it's going to get larger scale, and therefore you're participating in it. The, the really interesting thing though is that when you compare it to um, uh, an equity like Facebook, sorry, like Meta or Google or Amazon or one of these, these large cap tech stocks, the network effect accrues to the shareholder. So add yeah, we could set up a Rachel book today um, and it could be the best technology in the world, but if it has no users, it has no value. So as you get more users, the value goes up and the value of that, that network effect goes to the shareholders. Whereas the difference in digital assets, the network effect goes to holders of the, the tokens. And so if you use the network and you, you participate in the network, you actually have a vested interest to help the network grow and to build it, and that's where the community aspect comes in. And that's why when you speak to people who, who are involved in the digital asset space, they seem to be very evangelical about it, because one, it feels like you've, you've understand what, it, what a lot of people haven't come to realise as yet, but also if they come to realise it and they participate, well, then you will benefit from that upside. So it's a very community feel. But I would say, you know, in, yes, in the day, that this space was um, full of a lot of bad actors and a lot of rug pulls and a lot of bad, bad um, happenings. That's been cleaned up now. If you stick to the, the big end of town, um, and you know, we said Ethereum is two hundred fifty billion, Bitcoin's north for five hundred billion. I mean, we're not talking small assets here. We're talking incredibly large assets. And so, when you think about it in that um, viewpoint, um, you should just do your work, and these the same way you would invest in any other any other asset. Yeah, thanks for that. I think that's a good sec to the second question, which is at the mm -hmm. risk, okay, sorry, <laughs> I'm just quoting verbatim. At the risk of being a Luddite, is there a risk of conflating blockchain technology with cryptocurrency? So, Wimal, you wanted to take that question? Yeah, I'll do that quickly. So, uh, so blockchain is, so generally, if you look at um, so, so Bitcoin, 
So Bitcoin's use case, Bitcoin has two use cases. It's the only digital asset which has two. Uh, the first one is the store of value, which is a social construct that we give to Bitcoin the same way we give it to gold. Um, the second one is actually a concrete um, st uh, use case, which is a peer-to-peer a, a, a peer -peer trustless payment system. It has value in that. It has um, you know, proof that it works. It's never broken down. It's worked. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And so all it is is if you Bitcoin is the is the um, is the is effectively what you have to pay to utilize the network. So the same way that if you're on Ethereum, you want to build an Ethereum. Yeah, the the because it's distributed, it means that everyone plugs their computers in and everyone uses a little bit of computing power together, distributed. Now to pay for that computing power that people are providing you, you have to pay Ether, Ethereum. So anything that's built on that system, you have to pay to run it. It's called a gas fee, and that is the use of the native currency of the, of the blockchain. And so the way you think about it is, is that each blockchain has a digital asset or cryptocurrency associated with it, and that's the way you access the, the blockchain. But you can, so if you're buying a digital asset, you buy it because one, you have a view on the blockchain, or two, you have a view on the, the future use of that, that blockchain or protocol and how how prevalent it's going to be the same way you buy Domino's pizza because you think they're going to sell more. It's the same uh, concepts all the way through. Okay, so taking that a little bit further, also there are a few questions uh, kind of just wanting to expand on like the use case of crypto, right? How does that, I mean, or, or even like this whole blockchain, like these networks, like what use do they have in our daily life? So we, we've been talking about kind of the network effect, the kind of use of these networks, the kind of adoption. Um, and yeah, we're hearing like, terms like DeFi or GameFi can't bend it around, but what, what use does it actually have in like normal people's lives? And therefore, you know, how is it going to be that this network is going to be really widely adopted and therefore the crypto use in that network is going to be really used, uh, you know, have, have value, right? So um, yeah, open to the floor. Anyone wants to start? Maybe I can start on that. I can actually give some example that I see how cryptocurrency is being um, uh, a relevant use case in real life. Uh, like take, for example, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, one example of cryptocurrency relevancy lies in the domain of cross-border remittance. Uh, this is particularly relevant in countries like, for example, Philippines, where the significant portion of the population would abort and relies on remittance to support their families back home. Uh, traditionally, cross-border remittance have been associated with very high fees, slow processing time, and involvement of a lot of in, uh, intermediary banks. Um, cryptocurrency, however, present an innovative solutions to this challenge. Um, the blockchain technology which underpins cryptocurrency enable near instantaneous and low cost transfer across the borders. So for instance, um, using cryptocurrency, a worker in the Middle East could send their funds directly to their family in the Philippines without the need for the intermediaries. This not only reduces fees, but also accelerates the availability of funds uh, for the recipient. And moreover, it provides um, a transparent and temper resistance record of the transaction, enhancing security and reducing the risk of funds. Um, then another example, which is related to one of the alternative holding I mentioned just now uh, regarding real world asset tokenizations, and I'm, I will be actually looking into a regions like UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, the real estate market has always been a cornerstone of the economy. And with the diverse populations and booming uh, expertise communities, the de demand for a real estate transaction is very high. However, trans traditional real estate transactions often involve complex process, intermediaries, and time-consuming paperwork uh, within UAE regions. And therefore, cryptocurrency introduces a fresh perspective to this scenario. Uh, like in the Dubai, the, real, the uh, Dubai real estate market, for instance, they have seen the emergence of projects that accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment for property purchase. Uh, this innovative approach not only attracts international buyers, but also streamlines you know, the transactions process itself. And cryptocurrency transactions are categorized by speed, transparency, and low fees compared to traditional methods. 
imagine a scenario where in an uh, international investor can purchase property in Dubai using cryptocurrency, eliminating the need of multiple intermediaries and reducing the time it takes to finalizing the deals. Uh, this not only expedites the buying process, but also introduce a level of transparency that builds trust between the buyer and seller. Um, and last example, I just wanted to highlight, um, which that will be something that actually ChainUp involved uh, in the project itself. Um, so ChainUp actually has partnered with NUS, National University of Singapore Business School, to provide our MPC, multi-party computational technology, and jointly develop an innovative NFT wallet. And this NFT uh, will be offered as a reward security to EMBA um, alumni and students who have attached uh, who have attended the NUS EMBA master class. Uh, this initiative demonstrated uh, our commitment, you know, to foster innovation and supporting the professional growth in the community. At the same time, it will be also uh, moving forward, actually moving forward in the next phase. So you can see that we can even use uh, this uh, related, NFT related to replace, you know, the university certificate, for example, because it's actually a transparent and a legit record on the blockchain that they can use from the educational certificate perspective. So I thought I would just uh, provide these three examples uh, to highlight what are the actual use case in our life. I'll okay. jump in. I think the, the, the I think the a, a lot of it and is covered, but the, the, the key thing is that your blockchain technology will be used for efficiency gains that no one will ever see. So you look at the banks, they're all ripping out old antiquated systems. You look at the financial market infrastructure, Cedar, Euroclear, you've got you know thousands of different proprietary systems of banks all sticky past the solution together. And it works, but it's incredibly inefficient. And so if you're able to align um, a lot of the, the protocols onto certain blockchains that exist, it means you get massive cost savings. So all this happens without anyone knowing it's happening, but you're just generally making things much more efficient and cheaper. And for example, you'll you'll see this because you'll interact with your your phone and apps on your phone. The same you do, but you don't know this blockchain technology. So for example, you know California is trialing uh, NFTs for driving licenses now, and so that you won't see that. You'll just see your driving license on your phone the same way I see it on my phone, but it will be on the blockchain as an NFT. And so a lot of the technology and a lot of the, the, the reasoning and the, the builds are happening around the blockchain this last space you will never know about. But what they do is they'll just massively increase cost and it will also pull out this intermediation out of the, the markets as well as the middleman's effectively disintermediated away. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I think there've been several questions like kind of just wanting to explore a little bit more on kind of like the pricing, how, what the expectations are. And I think maybe speak a little bit about how, you know, funds like Trovio and Bitcoin, you kind of, oh, sorry, and, and um, Bentonia, you looked and dealt with the kind of bad actor actions last year. Uh, Adrian, you want to start? Sure. I guess, um, <clears throat> I mean, 2022 was a difficult year for the industry, but probably the, uh, the cleansing that needed to to happen, um, and uh, if we just recall what happened in 2022, uh, it started with probably the collapse of uh, the Terra Luna so-called stable algorithmic stablecoin, and it set off a, a a wave of I guess um, bankruptcies from Three Arrows, Hotel North to uh, ultimately uh, Genesis, uh, BlockFi, and, and a number of uh, companies, at least from. Uh, being, I guess, a bit more traditional at Fintonia, we we had zero impact from any of these uh, failed counterparties, and and essentially it is uh, because we always are trying to minimize counterparty risk, and 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 the way you do that um, uh, typically is to sweep assets as much as you can off uh, off exchanges, and then from a from a let's call it more technical. Mm, geek perspective, because on public blockchains, you can actually analyze when transactions uh, are happening and flow. So uh, if you are, let's call it more digital asset native, you can actually follow or see when there is a run on a counterparty. And obviously in a run, uh, you, you want to be first out the door, not the last out the door. So I think traditional risk management approaches that uh, I guess my team and I that we have 
combined with, I guess, understanding of the ecosystem and the technology and the tools you have, um, kind of uh, protected us from any of that kind of uh, fallout. For us, I think investors, for us, understand that Bitcoin is volatile, so that if Bitcoin falls 20%, they kind of get it. Are they happy? No, but they understand that's the nature of the asymmetric return. It can go down, but it can go up a lot more. That's that's their thesis. What they don't like to hear is 20% of my assets are gone because I got hacked or 20% of my assets are gone because, you know, somebody went, went under. So, I mean, for us, it was a difficult year, but our investment strategy, which is track the price of Bitcoin, uh, uh, worked well. And, and certainly we did had, had no impact of any counterparty collapses. We, okay. we were the same. So we have um, yeah, very, very minimal exposure. Um, we run two funds, one had no exposure to FTX, one uh, because everything was held in, in cold storage. Um, and the other one had very, very minimal exposure. And again, we're watching the market aware that something was happening and started pulling assets incredibly quickly. And so I think Adrian's point is right. My clients are happy to have market risk. They don't want operational risk. Um, and so that's that's one of the things you try and solve for as much as you possibly can and try and make sure that the that the portfolios are as robust as they can be in that operational. And that's that's evolving all the time. I mean, you're moving to a world of tri-party repo. When you when you eventually get CBDCs across the world, that would be amazing because they allow atomic settlement. And so the, the whole world infrastructure is changing. And whether you want to invest in digital assets or not, they get the adoption of digital assets globally is going to impact how you manage your asset class and how you hold your um, your assets and how the registry of assets and all of this is going to change material over the next five years, whether you want to invest in the asset class or not. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I, I think you, both of you have kind of brought up a point, right? Like with uh, regulated kind of fund managers like you, uh, you guys and kind of like working at the kind of institutional institutional level and with the kind of institutional partners that you have, you're able to um, kind of deal with a lot of the operational risk that you might not be able to if you're a single investor dealing with your own crypto wallets and having to kind of look for best execution at the scale that you not, might not be able to if you're a larger player. So I think that's something that um, people should kind of take into consideration as well. So we're coming near to the top of the hour. So I'm just going to give like a chance for each of the speakers to give a single takeaway for your audience tonight. So uh, do you want to start with any? Sure. Um, I think my takeaway point will be we are actually standing on the uh, cliff of uh, digital evolutions fueled by blockchain and Web3. Uh, we should seize the moment, embark on this transformation journey, and may innovation be our guiding star as we venture onwards. Okay, thanks. Uh, Adrian? So, I mean, what, what we think about at Fintonia, we always say, hey, we're here to bring order to chaos. Uh, it's chaos out there, but that's where you also make great returns. So it's about understanding um, how can you uh, profit from the volatility and the chaos. Uh, and, and the best way to do that is to really understand uh, uh, what you're doing, dip your toe into it, and work with some credible partners. Thanks. And Wimal? I, I think that's the key thing. Like, whether you choose to invest in this space or not is personal preference. We never try to convince anyone about the space. Um, if, if you want to invest, that's great. If you don't want to invest, that's also great. But uh, if you do want to invest, the key thing is make sure you pick the right partners to invest with. That you that there are because it's an emerging ecosystem and the regulation is emerging as well. It, the the really key point is making sure you. You pick the right partners who have a good understanding and track record in the space. They understand the risk. They try to mitigate them as much as they possibly can do. Like I said, you want you you have no problem wearing investment risk, but you don't want to have to bear the other risks as well. Like you know, certain risks you can't get away from, like regulatory risk. They're just inherent in the market. The certain ones like operational risks, you certainly can, and so you need to do that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian, Annie, and Ramal. It's been quite, I mean, it's been a really lively discussion. Uh, so to the rest of our audiences, we're, we're bringing it to a close now. Um, it, we'll really appreciate that you can stay on and kind of answer the polls that will kind of appear on your screens uh, right after this. So thank you for joining us. And we'll be, we'll keep having uh, these webinars uh, on a monthly basis. So do come and, you know, like look out for these as well. Thank you very much.
Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.